I was in the church the other night and Father Murphy was in great form in the pulpit. He stood up there, he gave us hell, fire and brimstone, the lot. He frightened the life out of us, he really did. He said, stand up, all those who want to go to heaven. Of course, we all stood up immediately. He said, sit down, and we all sat down. Now he said, stand up, all those who want to go to hell. Nobody stood up except Flanagan in the middle of the church. And Father Murphy said, Flanagan, do you want to go to hell? And Flanagan said, no, Father, he said, but I didn't like to see you standing there by yourself. <laughs> There's this television programme here in Dublin, and uh, it's for children, you see, and they give a special prize, you see, for the best, the most intelligent child on this programme. So the MC said, now he said to the children, he said, I want you to tell me who was the greatest man that ever lived. And this little boy stood up and said, he said, Sir Leonardo da Vinci. And the MC said, a very good answer. He said, he wasn't the greatest man that ever lived. And this other little boy said, please, sir, he said, it was Alexander Graham Bell who invented the telephone. And the MC said, a very good answer, but not quite what I was looking for. And then this little Jewish boy stood up and said, he said, please, sir, the greatest man that ever lived, he said, uh, is, uh, was St. Patrick. And of course, the uh, kid won the prize right away. So after the television program, the MC said, rather unusual for a little Jewish boy to say, St. Patrick, why did you say that? And the kid said, he said, well, deep in my heart, he said, I know it was Moses, but business is business. So I mean, you, you gotta get it down. <laughs> I like that. This fellow O'Shaughnessy was a hypochondriac. He was a terrible case altogether. When he died on his tombstone, he had his own epitaph and it read, now will you believe I'm sick? <laughs> <laughs> God between us and all harm, but there's none of us perfect, as you know. Wait till I tell you. This judge here in Dublin was a bit cross-eyed like myself, honest to God, yes. And one day he was in court and there was three fellas standing before him to be sentenced. And with the cross-eyes, God help us, you can imagine what would happen. Wait till you hear this. So the, he was addressing the three of them and he said to the first fella, what's your name? And the second fella answered, Pat Murphy. <laughs> the judge says, I wasn't talking to you. And the third fellow said, I never opened my mouth. <laughs> <laughs> Write it down, it's a good one. <laughs> Write it down. God knows it's simple. <laughs> Wait, I tell you, I, I have a quotation here from the Kerryman newspaper, you know, down in Kerry. You probably heard about the Kerryman that was disqualified from the tug of war team for pushing. <laughs> I like it. <laughs> this is from the Kerryman newspaper. A supermarket was broken into the other night and 5,000 cigarettes and 10 dozen heads of lettuce were stolen. The police are now looking for a rabbit with a bad cough. <laughs> can you hear me on the mantelpiece over there? You can. Oh, there's the rich people on the shelf. Good evening. Oh yes, they're all the rich people tonight. Yes, indeed. Did you hear about this fella O'Shaughnessy wanted to be buried at sea and four of the lads were drowned trying to dig the grave? <laughs> <clears throat> this fella, Murphy, the priest was trying to get him off drink for years, but it was no good. He was drunk out of his mind day and night. And one day he met the priest in the street and he said, Father, what's lumbago? And the priest thought, this is it, I'll frighten the life out of him. He said, that's what you get, he said, when you're out half the night drinking. He said, too much wine, women and song, he said, and staggering and making a general nuisance of yourself. Why do you ask? And your man said, I was reading in the paper this morning that the bishop has it. <laughs> oh, I only wish I could be out there with you to hear this. This fellow Murphy was up in court the other day and the judge said to him, Murphy, you were brought here by two police officers. He said, I was, Your Honour. The judge said, drunk, I suppose. He said, yes, Your Honour, they were, the two of them. <laughs> <laughs> this fellow Murphy went to the barber's last week. He said to the barber, how much is a haircut? The barber said, three pounds. He said, how much is a shave? He said, one pound. He said, right, shave me head. <laughs> 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 Write it down, it's a good one. Well, well, it's a lovely good one. Hello? Up in Donegal one night late, I was trying to get a room for the night, you see, with my chest. But anyway, I have a bad chest, so at two o'clock in the morning, I was knocking at this boarding house in the hills of Donegal, and eventually the woman opened the top window and she called down to me, she said, what do you want? 
I said, can I stay here for the night? She said, yes. And with that, she slammed the window down and left me standing there. <laughs> Everybody's explaining that to everybody else. <laughs> can I stay here for the night? Yes. <laughs> A lot of people have been admiring this. Now, madam, you're a good judge of jewellery. That diamond I'm wearing, just take a look at that beautiful diamond ring. Isn't it lovely? The story behind that is very interesting. Concerns my mother-in-law. What a woman, drummed out of the Gestapo for cruelty. <laughs> she's dead. Gone now. At least I hope she's gone. You can't trust them. <laughs> Before she died, she called me to her bedside. She said, Hal, during my lifetime, I have amassed a great amount of money. She said, and when I'm dead, in remembrance of me, I want you to get a nice stone. Look at that ring, isn't it beautiful? Isn't it? <laughs> beautiful job, diamond, lovely. <laughs> it's a piece of glass, but it looks good. You know, ladies and gentlemen, the show you're watching now has just finished a coast-to-coast -coast tour of the United States and Canada. We did 48 states in three months. It was incredible. The, the, the traveling was incredible. We were in places at like Cody, Wyoming. Have you ever been there? I, yes. I slept in Buffalo Bill's bed there. I was in Tutankari in New Mexico, I was Pascagoula, I was in Riverton and all over America. It was quite incredible. But New York still has a fascination for me. I... Oh, yes. Yes, it fascinates me that I can survive in the place. But I tell you... I... <laughs> it's lovely. I could start a war here tonight, you know that. <laughs> We've been in enough trouble as it is, but however. No, we're gonna tell you, no, honest to God. I mean, New York is fascinating. Did you ever notice if you stand still in the streets of New York for 15 seconds, somebody writes on you? <laughs> yes. I went to Macy's one day shopping. I said to the lady, I'd like to buy a few things. She said, of course, do you have a list? I said, no, I always stand like this. <laughs> list. I bought, yeah, list. <laughs> I bought a book in Macy's called How to Be Happy Without Money. It costs forty dollars. <laughs> I went down to the basement, by the way, and I said to the guy, "Can you show me the cheapest suit in the store?" He says, "You're wearing it." <laughs> <laughs> On St. Patrick's Day, we were in Buffalo, New York. We crossed over the border to Welland, and we went into to see Niagara Falls. It's quite a sight, isn't it? Did you hear about the Irish plumber looking at Niagara Falls? He said, I think I can fix this. <laughs> <clears throat> yeah. But it was really terrific over there. I mean, and then, of course, we went to Las Vegas. Very exciting in Las Vegas. We, I have property there now. Two of the hotels are holding my bags. <laughs> Did you hear about the Irish farmer that was awarded the Nobel Prize for being outstanding in his own field? <laughs> Up in the north of Ireland in the country, there's a man riding down the road on a donkey and his poor wife walking behind him. Yes, I said, why is your wife walking and you're riding a donkey? And he said, she hasn't got a donkey. <laughs> it's a good straight answer if you think about it. <laughs> <laughs> Any guests here tonight from the Gresham Hotel? The Gresham? Where? Here. Your bus is gone. Two rabbits been chased by a pack of wolves, and one rabbit said to the other, let's get down in this hole and stay there till we outnumber them. <laughs> the other rabbit said, keep running, I'm your brother. I'll tell you this, we, we don't... <laughs> we get many distinguished people to our cabaret over the years here and since we opened last may we had mr omar sharif playing bridge in dublin here come to see us a couple of weeks later we had mr great american comedian jackie gleason oh the greatest the honeymooners oh fantastic we had um, mr harry reasoner here your newsreader from america with miss barbara walters together <laughs> nobody believes me they were at the same table believe it or not and a famous Hollywood cowboy here three weeks ago, we were delighted to see Mr. Gene Autry. Do you remember Gene Autry? A marvellous man, lovely man. 
Yes. And Princess Caroline, just before she married, of course, was here with her mother, Princess Grace, and Prince Rainier of Monaco. Lovely people. Uh, I think last night eclipsed everything for me. I was, a, a little card came off one of the tables inviting me to join them for a glass of champagne after the show. This is not a hint of any kind, of course, but, uh, you know, <laughs> feel free to please yourselves, of course. I went down to the table and I was introduced to His Majesty King Faisal of Saudi Arabia. Well, that's what the man said. He said, if you're a comedian, I'm... <laughs> well, you can't win them all. When I was a little boy, I used to listen very attentively to my mother and my father talking because my parents had a certain way of talking, even at that age, I realized, was different to other people. I made a long playing album about Irish humor. It took me many years to do it, and I devoted most of it to the authenticity of Irish conversation because we're so different when we talk. It would be a great shame if we ever lost this. And there's a little bit of Irish in everybody. And for the next couple of minutes as I talk now, you will recall with nostalgia that your parents and your friends and your grandparents used to talk this way. Now, when we talk, we answer a question first, and then we ask it. We do, we do. We say things like, uh, you won't have a drink, will you? Or you're not going out, are you? Do you know what I mean? We... <laughs> a woman met me in the lobby tonight. She said, you're not Hal Roach, are you? Do you know what I mean? We talk that way. I love when they walk up to you and they look you straight in the eye and they say, is that yourself? I mean, who else, for God's sake? <laughs> I, and I also like when you're walking down the street and somebody recognizes you and they say, ha ha, there you are, I love that one. I mean, that's a <laughs> brilliant deduction, that is. I was sitting at that table one night and a fellow from Galway recognized me. He walked right up to me and he said to me, have you not gone home yet? And him looking at me sitting at the table. <laughs> but this is the way your parents used to talk. I arrived in the lobby here one night with two suitcases and the porter took my bags and said, Mr. Roach, follow me and I'll be right behind you. <laughs> That's what he said. We talk like that, honest to God. How many times since you arrived in Ireland have you been sitting in the lobby of a hotel or a restaurant and there's an empty chair like that beside you? Inevitably, somebody will come up to you and say, is there anybody sitting there? <laughs> Right? I bet it happened today. Did it happen today? It'll happen again tomorrow. All day long. All day long. I met Hennessy the other night, by the way. Pat Hennessy, he's a relation of mine through drink. And I met him in a pub and I said, I believe you sold your bicycle to Murphy for 30 pounds. He said, I did. I said, that was a good price. He said, it was. He said, but if I'd known he wasn't going to pay me, I'd have charged him twice as much. <laughs> It's lovely the way we talk, it really is. I tell you, I was standing at a bus stop some time ago. There was 25 of us standing at this bus stop. We were um, waiting for the bus at the time. And do you see what I mean? We talk like that. And this fella walked up to me with a classic Irish unnecessary remark. He said, do you know what I'm going to tell you? I was down in Killarney doing a little television show in Killarney and driving back to Dublin, I came through Killaloo County, Qua uh, County Clare, <laughs> this little village, and uh, I had a thirst in the car you could have photographed, honest to God. I have it again now. I had such a thirst that I went into this pub and had a quick pint of Guinness. It never reached my stomach. My tongue soaked it up. And there's five or six of the lads in the pub discussing religion, who was what and what was who, and one fella said, well, I'm an atheist, thank God. <laughs> And the other fellow said, there's only one thing wrong about being an atheist. You get no holidays. <laughs> <laughs> oh, write it down for God's sake, write it down. <laughs> and I met a taxi driver there from County Cork. I said, is it true if you ask a Corkman a question, he always answers you with another question. He said, who told you that? <laughs> anyway. They filmed The Quiet Man up in Mayo in Con Castle about 27 years ago. I remember it well. John Wayne, Victor McLagan, the lovely Maureen O'Hara and all the lovely people were there. She, God knows they're nearly all gone now. But recently I was up in Mayo and there's a little newspaper shop beside Con Castle. And I went in there to get the newspaper and this woman recognised me from my television shows. And she said, uh, <laughs> is that yourself? 
I said, it is. She says, it's me too. <laughs> so I said, it's the two of us then. She said, it is. I said, I'm glad. She said, so am I. I thought it was somebody else. Well, I mean, this could go on forever. So I said, I'd like the newspaper. She said, yes, would you like today's paper or yesterday's paper? I said, I'd like today's paper. Well, she said, you'd have to come back tomorrow. <laughs> oh, dear God, I'll have to lie down for a while. Did you ever ask somebody the directions in, the, in, in Ireland in your car, by the way? Did you ever, isn't it fantastic? Isn't it fantastic? Recently, I was, lo I was looking for Skibbereen County Cork, and this is a classic. It's got to be a classic. I stopped this fellow and I said, good day to you. He said, good day to yourself. I said, I'm looking for Skibbereen. He said, are you now? I said, I am. But he said, I'll tell you how to get there. I said, thank you. Now, he said, here's how you get to Skibbereen. Now, listen to this very carefully. Listen to the connotation of words here. He said, now, you'll take the telegraph poles with you for a mile. Just listen to this for a classic. Now he said, after a mile, you'll drop the poles and turn left. <laughs> Are you getting this all down now, madam? <laughs> Write it all down now. I says, and when you turn left, he said, you'll come to a little village and you'll think you're in Skibbereen, but you're not. <laughs> now he said, you'll pick up the telegraph poles again and you'll carry the poles with you for two miles. And he said, you'll drop the poles and turn right, and you'll come to a little village, and you'll think you're not in Skibbereen, but you are! <laughs> Isn't that lovely? Beautiful! It's nice. It's nice. Down in, in Dingle County, Kerry, they photographed Ryan's daughter. David Lean stayed here for two years making that picture. And the storm you saw in that picture, by the way, he waited 11 months to get that. But when he got it, he got a beauty. This fellow Flanagan is walking down the street in County Kerry in Bally David, the, the lovely beach in Bally David. And he's got his front door under his arm. And Casey met him and said, Flanagan, where are you going with the front door? And Flanagan said, I lost the key. And Casey said, well, you had better not lose the door or you won't be able to get in. <laughs> and Flanagan said, it doesn't matter, I left the window open. <laughs> I'll have to lie down. The only way you're sure of getting a drink when the pubs close in Ireland is find out who's dead and where they're holding the wake. <laughs> and you're in for the night. This fella Hennessy went to the wake the other night and he said to the widow, I'm sorry for your trouble. He had a good few drinks, he had a quick look at the corpse and he came back to the widow and he said, I don't think your husband is dead at all. He said, I just saw his eyelashes flickering and his lips moving. And the widow said, well, dead or alive, he goes out of here at nine o'clock in the morning. <laughs> <laughs> write it down, it's a good one now. Come on, write it. You gotta, you gotta, you gotta write it down. You gotta write it down. I'll never forget up in Donegal, you see, which is a lovely county. The hospitality of the Irish is unbounding. And I stopped at this little, little, you know, farmhouse for a drink. Now, they don't give you water, they'll either give you a bowl of buttermilk or a drop of the potcheen. Have you ever had the, the Irish Mountain Dew, the, the potcheen? Great for dandruff. Have you tried it? It would take the paint off the door. <laughs> but the woman gave me a bowl of buttermilk and I was drinking it and this little pig came up and was nibbling at me shoe. I said, my God, he's a very friendly little pig. She said, why wouldn't he be? You're drinking out of his bowl. <laughs> I remember the little pig down there. Pig. That's a joke, of course. But anyway, the thing... Anyway, talking about the potching, you know, do you know that it's a sin to make potching in Ireland? It really is a sin. And this young curate, you see, came to the village for the first time and was hearing confessions the first day. And this fellow said, Father, he said, I'm after making eight gallons of pochi. And the young curate, you see, wasn't, wasn't familiar with the penance in that parish for this particular offence. So he said, excuse me. And he went into the sacristy and the bishop was half asleep in the chair. And he said, Bishop, I have a fellow out in the confessional and he's after making eight gallons of pochi. What will I give him? And the bishop said, give him two pound a gallon and not a penny more. <laughs> I... I... It's a good one. <laughs> Write it down. It's a good one. It's a good one.
were sitting in the pub having a drink, you see. And we're all, and this big fella, about six foot four, dashed into the pub and he said, is there a fella here called Rooney? And this little fella like myself stood up and said, I'm Rooney, what about it? And the big fella nearly killed him. He broke six of his ribs, broke his nose and gave him two black eyes and dashed out of the place. And when he was gone, the little fella picked himself up and said, I sure made a monkey out of him. He said, sure I'm not Rooney at all. <laughs> <laughs> There's a little fella sitting beside me and he said to the bartender, I'd like a bottle of champagne. And the bartender said, of course, what year? He said, I, I'd like it now. <laughs> this is the best side over here. Listen, I want... It's a lot of, a lot of class over here tonight, there really is. Oh, yes. My uncle Pat down Waterford, he reads the death column every morning in the paper and he can't understand how people always die in alphabetical order. <laughs> and they do, did you notice that? I don't mean to be morose, but I see humour in all things. Laughter is the great valve of life. The world today is beginning to forget how to laugh, which is very sad. We have to bring it back because laughter is so necessary to our well-being. If we don't laugh, we disintegrate and we fade away. So we've got to learn to laugh. It's, it's imperative that we laugh. I see humour in the death columns. In, you know, I, I don't mean to be disrespectful, but if you read these in memory of, in memoriam, if you change the tone of your voice, they can have a different meaning, a different connotation altogether. Listen to this. In memory of my husband, Seamus O'Shaughnessy, may he rest in peace until we meet again. <laughs> They're all explaining that all around the room. <laughs> my wife, by the way, who is a relation of mine by marriage. I don't mind confessing that my wife converted me to religion. I never believed in hell till I married her. Funny woman, she went to the doctor some time ago to have her face lifted again. They said they couldn't do it, so she had her body lowered. <laughs> Even when we make love, she closes her eyes. She hates to see me enjoying myself. I, 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 funny woman, I, it's not a sin to laugh at that, honest to God. I'm just finishing a book about doctors at the moment. The medical profession men, they're funny men, you know. They really... There's a fellow sitting beside me waiting to see the doctor and he's wearing a corset. You know, a co I said, a corset, yes. I said, how long have you been wearing that? He said, ever since my wife found it in the car. Now, I... I... Well, God forgive you for taking the wrong meaning out of that. The Father Murphy was here to clear the hall. <laughs> I went to see the doctor some time ago. I lost my voice and I couldn't talk as well. And I, <laughs> I couldn't talk as well. Yes, and I, I, I said, Doctor, I can't, I can't talk. I can't, I've lost my voice. He said, now just get into that little room, he said, and get undressed. I'll be right in to examine you. But I said, Doctor, it's my throat. He said, don't argue with me. Get in there and get your clothes off immediately. Well, you can't argue with the doctor. And I went into this little room and I got undressed. And there's a fella sitting beside me with nothing on but the radio. <laughs> I said to him, this is ludicrous. I come here with a sore throat and I finish up with no clothes on. He said to me, you're lucky. I only came here to tune the piano. This, ladies and gentlemen, this gold watch is the most beautiful thing I've ever worn. It chimes the hour. It's 126 years old, and it's got a gold sovereign on the end of it here, 1860. The fob is magnificent. It's got an amethyst stone embedded in it here. It's 120 years. Oh, it's magnificent. I'm proud to wear such a beautiful watch. It was my grandfather's. He was from Scotland, from Glasgow, a fine, upstanding Scotsman. He sold this to me on his deathbed. <laughs> And uh, I gave him a check. <laughs> we should digress momentarily from Irish humour and go to Nottingham, uh, to Sherwood Forest, where Robin Hood and his merry men are assembled on a very sad occasion. Robin Hood is dying. He called his faithful servant, Friar Tuck, to minister to him. He said, Tuck, the end is near. I'm sinking fast. But he said, before I die, 
I want you to open the windows of this cabin so that I might gaze for the last time on my beloved Sherwood Forest. So they open up all the windows. He said, now, bring me my fateful bow and arrow. And they do. He said, I shall fire my last arrow, and where it lands, that is where I wish to be buried. So they buried him on top of the closet. <laughs> I, met, uh, I met Pat Shanahan the other night in the street. And he was looking very downhearted. I said, what's the matter with you? Well, he said, the other morning I looked out the bedroom window and he said, I saw this tramp walk up and steal me front gate off the hinges. I said, what did you do? He said, nothing. I was afraid he might take offence. <laughs> <laughs> Take offence. She's explaining that to her over there, by the way. <laughs> the British government have been planning to build a tunnel, a motor tunnel from England to France for the last 80 years, and it's now underway. Now, the British government sent tenders to uh, countries all over the world to get a price to build this fantastic tunnel. Australia said 600 million pounds, America said 1,000 million dollars, Germany said 500,000 pounds, and they got one offer from, from Murphy and Son, builders, County Kerry in Ireland, 500 pounds. <laughs> they thought this is ridiculous. So they got Murphy to fly over and he addressed the, the board and the chairman said, now Mr. Murphy, how could you possibly build a tunnel from England to France for 500 pounds? And Murphy said, well, he said, you see, there's only myself and the son. He said, you see, we cut out the middleman. <laughs> see, that's how we do it. You see, he said, the sun goes over to France and starts digging from that side, he said, and I'll, I'll start digging from England, he said, and we'll meet in the middle, and there it is. And the chairman said, well, supposing you don't meet in the middle, what happens then? And Murphy said, in that case, you have two tunnels for the price of one. <laughs> oh, dear God. Listen. As we go through life, I don't understand how people can be sort of obnoxious and rude to each other. Life seems to be far too short to be like that, ladies and gentlemen. I remember one time here, and, and you know, I was at a dance, and there's a lady sitting alone, and I, I think she's lonely. And being a gentleman, I walked up to her, and I said, good evening, would you like to dance with me? She said, no, I'm particular who I dance with. I said, well, I'm not, that's why I asked you. I mean, you have... <laughs> I tell you, about two years ago here, there was flooding in this country for six weeks non-stop. You've never seen anything like the, the, the floods. And this little fellow, Murphy, dashed into the pub one day and he said to his pal Casey, he said, your house has just been washed away by the flood tide. And uh, Casey said, it couldn't be. He said, I have the key here in my pocket. <laughs> this fellow, Shanahan, went to the doctor last week and the doctor examined him. And after half an hour, he said to Shanahan, I can't find anything wrong with you. He said, I'll have to put it down to drink. And Shanahan said, that doesn't matter, I'll come back one day when you're sober. <laughs> <laughs> this fellow Murphy went into the pub the other night, he ordered six pints of Guinness, six vodka, six brandies, and six lemonades. And the bartender said, would you like a tray? He said, no, I have enough to carry as it is. <laughs> We all like to help out during the harvest season here, and by the looks of things, it won't be that good this year, will it, the harvest? I went to this farm one day, and I said to the farmer, could you use me on the land? He said, we have special stuff for that. It's the way you ask them, you see. They don't understand how. It's the way you ask. They don't understand, you see. We laugh at politics. We laugh at religion. It's good to laugh. To see humour in all things is marvellous, though. It really is. I tell you, this fella, this old farmer, you see, up in Donegal, he went to confession and the priest said to him, did you ever sleep with a woman? And he said, I might have dozed off once or twice, Father. <laughs> now, that... I, they're all explaining that around the room here. They really are. Just, just, <laughs> this fella... Now, this is a favourite story of mine. I want you to listen to this very carefully. This fella, Murphy, he won £500,000 in the Irish sweepstakes and he went to Boston, lovely Boston, to see his brother who lived there. Uh, yes, lovely Boston. And on the way back, the plane had an emergency, and the, the, the pilot told them they might have to ditch, you see. And, of course, Murphy thought, my God, he said, I'm after winning a half a million pounds, and I'm going to be killed. So he got down on his knees in the plane. He said, God, he said, if you get me down safely, I'll give you half my fortune. And eventually, the plane landed safely. And as Murphy was getting off the plane, this priest walked up to him and said, I couldn't help overhearing your, <laughs> your very nice gesture. He said, I'm sure you'd like to start right away to give half your fortune to God. 
And Murphy said, no, he said, after the plane landed, he said, I made a new deal with God. I told him if I ever went up in a plane again, he could have it all. <laughs> but we see humor in all things, the wife, the mother-in-law, religion. Of course, the clergy are, are relenting a little bit now. They're allowing a new pill here in Ireland for the women. You see, it weighs three tons. And the women roll it up against the bedroom door and the husbands can't get in. And... She's explaining that again here. <laughs> this fellow Murphy and his wife went shopping in Dublin to a big supermarket and they had the baby in the pram, you see. And they left the baby in the pram outside the supermarket and they went in and got the, the groceries. And when they came out, they got the baby in the pram and they're walking away about 100 yards and the wife got hysterical. My God, she said, Pat, we have the wrong baby. He said, keep quiet, this is a better pram. <laughs> <laughs> But uh, humor is so necessary to our well-being, you know. If we realized how much we needed, we'd chase it more. We really would. It's imperative that we laugh. This fellow Hennessy was going to make his first parachute jump. And just before he was going to do the jump, he was having a final briefing by the instructor. And the instructor said, now, Hennessy, this is what you do. He said, first of all, you have to go up in the plane. Now, he said, when you're up about 6,000 feet, he said, I want you to jump out. And he said, seeing that it's your first parachute jump, he said, I don't want you to pull the ripcord until you're about 10 feet from the ground. Because he says, if it doesn't open, you won't have far to fall. <laughs> You've got to write that down. It's, a... it's lovely, isn't it? These two fellas, Casey and Flanagan, they were fond of a game of golf. They were great sportsmen. One day they met in the street and Casey said to Flanagan, he said, I had a funny dream last night. He said, I dreamt there was a knock on my door. He said, I got up and outside the door, he says, with the world famous golfer, Jack Nicholas. He said, and he invited me out for a game of golf. He said, and I went out and I played golf with him and I beat him. And, um, and, Flanagan, and, and, and Flanagan said, uh, he said, that's funny. He said, you should have mentioned that. He said, because uh, I had a dream last night too. He said, I dreamt that I went home to my house and two of the most beautiful ladies in the world were in my house. He said, Sophia Loren and Elizabeth Taylor. He says, and there I was with the two ladies. I couldn't entertain them on my own. And your man said, why didn't you uh, phone me? He said, I did, but you were out playing golf with Jack Nicholas. <laughs> You know, we in Ireland refer to men from different counties as a Cork man, a Kerry man, a Sligo man, a Donegal man. You know, if he comes from that part of the country, that's what we say. He's a Kerry man or he's a Cork man. Anyway, this fellow Murphy, he got a job, actually. Murphy got a job as the first mate on a ship, on a cruising ship. And one day the captain sent for him. He said, Murphy, I want you to proceed to cabin 36 and have the occupant who died during the night buried at sea. He said, yes, captain. So he, he went away, and an hour later he came back and he said, Captain, I proceeded to cabin 26, and I had the occupant buried at sea. And the captain said, Good God, I said, cabin 36, who was in 26? And Murphy said, a fellow called Maloney from Kerry. And the captain said, was he dead? And Murphy said, well, he said he wasn't. He said, but you know these Kerry men, they're terrible liars. <laughs> you got to write that down, it's a good one. A little bit of heaven fell from out the sky one day. It landed in Galway and it is called Connemara, one of the jewels of the Emerald Isle, untouched by the so-called progress of our great big modern world today, which needs a lot of help, believe me. Anyway, uh, my sister lives there. Life goes by quietly and peacefully. But there was a big circus in Galway last year and this big elephant escaped from the circus and they couldn't find it for two weeks. And do you know, do you know where it finished up? In my sister's back garden in Connemara. It did. And she went out to hang up the washing and she saw it. She nearly died. Oh, she nearly died. She'd never seen the like of it. She rushed into her husband. She said, Pat, for God's sake, will you come out quick? There's a funny looking animal in the garden and he's picking up the potatoes with his tail. <laughs> and her husband said, what's he doing with them? She said, if I told you, you wouldn't believe me. Now, I... I... Don't explain that to her. <laughs> and God forgive us all for laughing at it. It's not a sin to laugh at that, honest to God. It's not a sin. It's only a sin if you take pleasure in it. <laughs> you know, I stand up here every night. I never get over the joy and the happiness it brings me to hear people laugh. An hour ago, we didn't know each other. Now I feel we all know each other. There's a lot of warmth in this room tonight, and you know why that is? Because for a little while, we laugh together. 
And when we laugh, everything else is obliterated from our minds. No worries can get in there, no income tax, no mother-in-laws, nothing. We laugh together and we forgot the world for an hour and it's beautiful. Laughter is the food of the soul. We can't live without it. If we don't laugh, we disintegrate, as I say, and we die, slowly pine away. Everything we do in life is relative to laughter. To laugh is to love, to laugh is to understand, to laugh is to forgive. We must laugh. The laughter of children is beautiful, and a smile can be devastating. Let me tell you the meaning of a smile. It costs nothing. It creates much. It enriches those who receive without impoverishing those who give. It happens in a flash, and the memory of it sometimes lasts forever. There are none so rich that they can get along without it, and none so poor but are richer for its benefits. It creates happiness in the home, fosters goodwill in a business, and is the countersign of friends. It is rest to the weary, daylight to the discouraged, sunshine to the sad, and nature's best antidote for trouble, and yet, it cannot be begged, bought, borrowed, or stolen, for it is something that is no earthly good to anyone until it is given away. So if in the course of the day, your friends may be too tired to give you a smile, then why don't you give them one of yours? Because nobody needs a smile more than those who have none left to give. Smile.